Hi, it's Jake here, and welcome to The Voluntary Life. This is part one of an interview with Paul Rosenberg, who is the author of the novel A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. So I hope you enjoy the interview, and thank you so much for listening. Um, welcome, everyone, and, and uh, <coughs> welcome, Paul. I'm, I'm really um, pleased to say that um, we have uh, Paul Rosenberg uh, on the line, um, and we're going to talk about his book, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men. So... Thanks so much for, for joining us, Paul. Oh, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here. <laughs> so maybe I could start us off, Paul. Um, I would love to ask you sure. just, just um, as a sort of a bit of background. I mean, this is a, I found this a fascinating book, absolutely packed with ideas and, you know, a really interesting book for anybody who's interested in ideas about freedom, uh, liberty, voluntarism, uh, uh, these kinds of ideas to, to, to look at. So I would just be really uh, curious because I, I don't know really anything about your background. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about how you became interested in the ideas of, of liberty and, and how, what your sort of intellectual development was towards uh, those ideas? Oh, certainly. Um, what a great question, though. You know, you, you kind of analyze it once in a while and say, well, where did this begin? Yeah. Um, you know, I can remember being, oh gosh, I must have been 16. I know I was driving, so I must have been at least 16. Um, you know, driving down the street and thinking, well, what is right and what is wrong? And, and, and coming up with actually almost word for word from John Locke or, or um, Thomas Jefferson, I decided that people should be free to do whatever they want as long as they don't hurt anybody, which is, you know, really basic and simple stuff but right. you know you wonder you wonder how these formulations you know took place um but some of the key milestones for me uh one of them was again right around that same age um i was in school thinking about all of these things i was in a very fortunate circumstance uh that at 14 and 15 years old i ended up at a gym of all places working out with very serious older men, uh, many of whom were very successful. These guys were in their 30s and 40s and 50s and 60s. And they were businessmen. Some of them were quite wealthy. Uh, there were some professional athletes. I, I was, you know, in a very unusual situation for a boy of my age. Uh, but anyhow, somehow I got into this group and they accepted me in. And after they got through the novelty of me being a kid, uh, I was just one of the guys sweating and trying to survive a workout. Um, but I got to, you know, view the world through the eyes of 40 and 50 year old men and all, you know, warts and all, all of the problems they had in business with wives and girlfriends, with booze, all of the various things that, you know, happen with such men. So I, I was kind of thinking a, a little bit more broadly than probably than most of my peers. And I was thinking about these things, what's right, what's wrong. And it just so happened one day in school, um, I was walking through, you know, out of a room and someone had hanging on the wall a copy of the American Declaration of Independence. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and read the preamble and I, it, just, it just struck me. I said, this is right. This is what's right. And then my very my second thought was is is I was mulling this over in my head was nobody believes this. <laughs> and now, if I, if I uh, remember rightly, the, the preamble is the bit about if you if you if the government isn't um, doing what you want it to do, then basically you you shouldn't have to put up with it, so to speak. Is is that the bit that you're talking about? That's one part of it. Yes, uh, the other part was um, the idea of inalienable rights, and these we you know these truths are self evident oh, right, that we right. should have we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right. and that anything that you know that con that's contrary to these ends should essentially be tossed off. Right. Right. So this really struck me, and then the second thing is I knew that nobody else really believed this stuff. And, uh, I, you know, I had just, I'd seen enough that, you know, nobody really was serious about that. Right. Um, so so <clears throat> that and other things put me on a, on a kind of a course of, um, 
I don't know what to call it, in, you know, continuing study. I read, I began reading theology and the Bible and history and philosophy and pretty much everything. And then probably another big event for me was in the 1990s, let's call it 1990, something around there, where uh, I happened to have a friend who was a prof- an economics professor, and he begged me, begged me, begged me to read this book, which, which was Atlas Shrugged. Right. And, um, you know, and I was very busy at the time, and I didn't have time to do it, but I finally read it, and it really was very helpful to me to um, provide perspective on things and to put a lot of pieces together. Uh, you know, it was a, a tremendous uh, help for me uh, to tie things to one another uh, in, in an intelligent way. Right, right. Uh, yeah, as the saying goes, it, it usually begins with Ayn Rand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for guys, for guys of, of my age, it definitely does. Right, right. It's interesting because I wanted to ask you about libertarian fiction because, you know, you've, you've written a novel and obviously that you've used the novel form to talk about a lot of ideas. And, you know, the, the, it's a sort of a philosophical novel. And Ayn Rand is, is one of the um, people that comes to mind who, who was, um, was doing that, too. So it's really interesting to, to hear that you were, you know, that that book was one of the things that influenced you. What, what were your did you um, were you particularly into libertarian fiction or did you go straight into all of the sort of Austrian economic stuff and, and all of that? You know, I actually um, went very quickly, uh, you know, through uh, Atlas and Fountainhead and then all of the nonfiction or almost all of the nonfiction that was available during those years. There's more now. Um, but, I, you know, I read four, five, six, seven, I'm not sure how many of Ayn Rand's nonfiction books. And then I read things um, like uh, The Market for Liberty by the Tannehills, yeah. uh, a Rothbard or two. Um, <clears throat> and I was really digging mostly into nonfiction, um, you know, and more interested, not so much in Austrian economics, which it was good, but it wasn't my particular interest. It was more the philosophy and history and psychology end of it. Um, Nathaniel Brandon's psychology of self-esteem was very important to me at one time. Right, right. Okay, and then I ended up uh, getting very deeply involved with the cypherpunks and um, the crypto-anarchy uh, movements. And spent a lot of time with them, uh, with uh, a lot of the uh, perpetual travelers, uh, those sorts of people. Right. Um, so I really was, it was really a, a hell of an interesting time. That's fascinating. Now, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, you, you mentioned that you, you sort of got involved in, in looking at um, a lot of the nonfiction stuff. You, you chose to write these ideas as a novel. And, and I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what was the... How did this book, um, A Lodging of Wayfaring Men, come about, and how did you become a novel writer? What was the sort of what was the origins of this book? Okay, um, you know it's a funny thing. I had been a writer for some time. I was writing nonfiction books uh, in engineering, essentially the construction business and engineering. Right. I'd been writing books in along those lines since the middle 1980s, at some point. <laughs> So I had developed the craft of writing, if you will, you know, to be able to turn out, you know, multiple books, which is, uh, you know, a, a uh, it's a trade all of its own. Right. Uh, so I was doing that, and then I began to kind of live the Atlas or Fountainhead sort of life, uh, and I became very deeply involved with people who were doing things. I became involved in the professional level in the fiber optics business, um, which was just exploding at that time and was a lot of fun. Uh, but I was involved in a lot of the foundational things in the fiber optic business. Um, and I was involved with a lot of, like I say, the cypherpunk and those sorts of people. <clears throat> and at some point, you know, I don't have a beginning date. There was no aha moment. I just began to realize that I needed to write a novel on this subject or on these subjects. Right. Um, 
you know, uh, nonfiction just wasn't going to do it as much as I like writing nonfiction. It just wasn't going to do it because the important things never show up in books and don't show up very well. In fact, they don't show up barely in Ayn Rand um, as much as I appreciate her work. You, you, her characters, they're kind of monochromatic. Um, real people doing these things are scared. Right. And they have moments of doubt. And even the bad guys, they're not purely bad. Often they started out as a decent guy who got corrupted. Um, so I wanted to, needed really, to write a book where you could see how real people became these types of characters and how they made their way and what it feels like to stand all alone knowing that what you're doing could blow up or it could become a great thing, and you can't tell which it is, and you just have to wait and see. Those are very different sorts of things that most people aren't used to, and I was in the middle of this, and it, it just really needed to be written, in my opinion. I think that's fantastic, and that, that's um, one of the things that I m most enjoy about this book, because I, I, I agree with you that um, when you read Iron Rand, you know, it's, it's, it's great stuff, and there are fantastic right. speeches in it. But the, the the heroes do seem to have just been born, you know, uh, right. brave and free. <laughs> and, and, you know, the rest of the world, uh, there's nothing that the rest of the world can do to really change them. And, and so in that sense, they are um, – it's all so black and white. And in, right. in, in your book, there are long conversations about, you know, well, the morality of – tax and whether or not it's going to you know the stress of breaking free of traditional expectations and and you know people thinking things over and wondering about what to do and and so forth so i, I really appreciate that that um yeah this is a book about um finding freedom and all of the uh you know um roller coaster ride that goes with that i think <laughs> yes i'm glad it came across yeah Oh yeah, absolutely. And there's a lot of um, you, you know, there are a lot of different characters in the book who have their own sort of arcs and trajectories. So it it sort of makes sense what you're saying because I imagine that you wanted to show, you know, for example, the cop who isn't really just an evil bad guy, and uh, and you know, mm -hmm. the, the the people at various different stages of of, uh, of finding freedom. So yeah, that, right. That really exactly. Comes oh, good. I want to ask you about um, cryptocurrency um, because, you know, mm -hmm. for me and many other people reading this book, you know, especially we're in the beginning of uh, 2012. So last year was, you know, Bitcoin year um, in terms of hitting right. the media and stuff. And, um, you know, I was reading this thinking, well, this is this is really interesting because uh, because of what's just just um, been happening um, with Bitcoin and and. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, you know, um, you, you mentioned that you obviously were um, aware of a lot of the sort of currents um, uh, around of, of people doing things like that. And, and what are your thoughts about your book and Bitcoin and the sort of the parallels, so to speak? Oh, I think there, there are a lot of parallels. I was actually thinking of things like Bitcoin um, when I wrote it. Um, the... Uh, you know, cryptocurrencies are just a, a very, very important big deal. Um, Bitcoin, which is not necessarily the best in my opinion, but who cares? A lot of people are using it now. Uh, this is the first one that's been popular and and it's, you know, it's quite good. Uh, you know, ideally, I would like to see the currency backed with gold or silver or something of value. But that's fine. I, I, you know, I, I, we don't have to have that in the first iteration. I just want decent crypto uh, where it's an actual, you know, digital currency where you have actual digital coins or properly digital bearer certificates is what they really are. Right. Um, so... You know, I was thinking about all this. There were people working on it back then. Uh, a gentleman named David Chaum, C H A U M, did some of the very first work. Uh, there was a team of guys in Anguilla that were doing some fine work on on digital coins. Um, a, 
a very flamboyant uh, and brilliant guy named Orlin Graby uh, did a lot of uh, a lot of work uh, on the subject. Uh, he's passed away now, unfortunately. Um, and uh, I, you know, I, I knew Orlin and I knew some of the, some of the things that were going on with his outfit, and they did some of the very first digital bearer certificates. Um, so it has been going on. Uh, it's also there. There's another. There's the crypto guys who are Chom and Graby and now Bitcoin, and then there are the did the gold guys, right? From the gold industry. Yeah, digital gold type so they, stuff. That's exactly right. Um, you know, uh, e gold was one for a long time that was huge. I mean, e gold was. Uh, there were, oh, I don't know, a number of billion dollars being transacted through eGold every year. And it was wonderful. It was convenient. It worked really well. Um, contrary to all of the naysayers, they really did have the gold. Um, we, we know that because when they were taken down, the, the, the U.S. federal government gave them receipts right. for the gold. <laughs> but... Um, you know, it was a, it was a, it wasn't an ideal system, uh, but it it worked quite well. Um, and there's been others. The one that I really like of the digital golds are are is Pecunix, um, which is a very fine system and it's done all the right way, uh, including off being entirely offshore because the U.S. is just an enemy jurisdiction for digital currency at the moment. Right. Uh, so. You know, we have all of that, and then there's a, another one called Voucher Safe, which is another sort of digital currency that's excellent. Uh, I recommend that one highly. Um, but anyhow, all of these things are the kinds of things I was I was looking at at the time and expecting to happen. Uh, so I'm, you know, very pleased with that. Right, right. It's interesting what you say about, um, you know, uh, other. Uh, cryptocurrencies that are sort of linked to to gold or something like that is that is that how you see things um kind of developing i mean do you do you do you see bitcoin as a sort of first iteration but other other things um uh, ultimately having more mileage in the long term or is it one of those situations where you just have to wait and see what the market does so to speak well you know i guess we we definitely have to wait and see what the market does all in the long run currency really does need to be backed by something. Um, it, I suppose it doesn't technically have to, but that's kind of been the history of humanity, right. is that you know currencies should be backed by something, therefore it's trustworthy without having to uh, you know, know the counterparty to the deal or you know, the issuing party. If it's based upon gold and redeemable in gold or silver or anything it doesn't really matter what what the store of value is uh it could be based upon corn or wheat or you know nickel or you know plywood it doesn't really matter uh gold was just traditionally used because it's you know it's you can get a lot of value in a very small package it's identifiable you can divide it it doesn't rot or rust or anything so you know gold is always good for that but pr I'm guessing that at some point there'll be Bitcoin version 2 and version 3, and at some point that will be backed by something of actual value. So you don't have to just worry – you don't have to worry about the currency. You know, you can always turn it in for whatever. Right, right, yeah. So I think it'll develop that way uh, over time. Um, I'm not sure precisely how. I'm sure it'll go left, right, you know, and then come back to the center. Yeah. The interesting thing is that the the novel itself is sort of a primer in in I guess the background ideas as to why you should be interested in such things in the first place, you know. So that that's um, one of the reasons why I enjoyed it was because it's kind of helpful for me to get a, um, to get my head around, you know, what what uh, what um, cryptocurrencies are, are all about, so to speak. So I, I oh, appreciated good. that. Yeah. Another thing that I wanted to ask you about a topic that a very interesting topic. Um, that comes up um, that you you sort of have I guess your characters in the novel to some extent represent like different different people's experiences or different paths or trajectories in life and so forth and you have um, the uh, the uh, Bill McCoy character who's who's the sort of described as an old pirate um, by himself and mm -hmm. and I think this character I I saw as being 
uh, you know, um, really a, a sort of a, a way of talking about the ideas that you mentioned of, of um, being a permanent tourist, because um, that seems to be right. what, what he sort of represents. And he's kind of explaining that to, um, to uh, you know, the academic, um, the, uh, mm -hmm. George and so forth. And, and it seems like that the whole concept of of being a permanent tourist is another thing that you uh, that you it seems to me like you wanted to talk about. Is that another thing that was important to you in, in writing this book? Yeah, it, it absolutely was, because it's a practical strategy that can be used to, uh, how shall I say, expand your freedom considerably. Yeah. And I, there are lots of people that do it, that live that way now. I've known several of them. Um, the, one of the gentlemen that I modeled McCoy after was kind of a PT consultant. And he helps people and does not exactly, but more or less what McCoy does. Right. And there are, peop there are people in that business that do those things on a daily basis. Uh, often it goes under the guise of offshore. Um, but there are people that do it, and there are people that live that way, actually quite a few of them. And it really, you know, with a, with a, a few difficulties here and there, it actually works quite well. Mm. Well, it really opened my eyes to that whole world. I, it was a fascinating yeah. thing to, to um, sort of follow up the threads that you put down there and, uh, and really, really interesting stuff, giving, giving me a lot of uh, food for thought. <laughs> oh, good. So I, I want to make sure that other people have a chance to, um, to ask you about the book too. So, um, guys, if you would like to, uh, anyone would like to uh, have any, any uh, questions uh, for, for Paul, please uh, jump in. Um, yes, I would. Uh, I have a question. I would like to ask um, if the internet has changed since you have uh, written the book in a way that um, would change your book. I mean, that that would want to want you to make any um, you know amendments on the book. Oh, good question. Um, not too much yet. Um, as of as of now, the various states are pretty much at war with the internet um, the basic conditions that were present when I when I finished the book and the basic conditions that are present now are pretty similar although it's gotten worse now uh, in the book I had people using um, you know anonymous remailers and anonymous proxies and so on uh, if I were writing it over today I would have them uh, using uh, anonymity networks and dark nets, um, which is just the, the version two of the same sort of thing. Uh, the reason for that is because the surveillance is so deep now, and it's done from so many sides and so many angles and so many places they look from that a single, what we call a single hop, you know, a plain proxy, um, a single hop is not sufficient anymore. Uh, if they can see what's coming into the hop and what's going out of the hop and then correlate them, then the anonymity is blown. Uh, so any more, a better anonymous system has to be used uh, than the ones that I described in the book. Um, but that's just about all now. If this continues and if they get their various kill switches and everything that they're going for, then we're going to have a very interesting moment where we may have to switch over um, to really old school technology like there was something in the original internet called FidoNet um, and things like that where we use long range Wi-Fi and ham radio and other things like that to have our own internet because uh, the, uh, the official internet will be just one giant surveillance tool. On that note, uh, do you see any? Are there anything? Is there anything you're aware of now that in get that I don't know that is allowing people to get ready for that? Because I think it's just a matter of time before we're at that point. Um, I've been trying to look into alternative internet technologies myself: ham, uh, packet radio, um, directional antennas ah, good. with 50 kilometer ranges, that kind of thing. Right. Those are exactly the kinds of things I'm talking about. I know there are a few people who are looking at it. 
Uh, exactly how much work is being done on it now, I don't know. Um, but I know that there are a few people that are looking at it and that have discussed it. Um, unfortunately, I'm afraid it will be a necessity at some point. Um, you know, who knows? But uh, it could, could very well be. And um, and would you say that the that the chances for uh, you know a big breakthrough of um, an anonymous con uh, commerce on the internet are now um, greater or smaller than than a few years back? Oh, I think they're definitely greater, although I certainly would have liked to have seen more progress before now. Um, but mm. it's definitely greater now. Bitcoin really has uh, helped a lot uh, because it, it got beyond the usual gold <laughs> crowd and the usual um, cypherpunk crowd uh, to get to a lot of more normal uh, people And it, Bitcoin is, is very popular. A lot of people are using it. It's a very, very good development, in my opinion. So I think the, the um, great expansion of digital commerce is actually more likely now than it was then. It seems to be that we're in this strange period of time where there's this amazing amount of information sharing going on on the Internet um, And, you know, commerce in all forms, but, all, you know, in particular, people sharing ideas and so forth that is, is just sort of unprecedented. The amount of information that's being generated and shared peer to peer by people. And agreed. And at the same time, you know, as you said, there's the opportunity for it to be used as one huge surveillance network. So it's, it's a kind <laughs> of uh, it's an, a very odd time in history, it seems. Oh boy, it sure is. It's just a strange, strange moment. Um, and it's strange in, in a lot of ways. Uh, the funny thing is, in, there are a lot of people who are, oh gosh, I don't, what, how should I say, voluntarists, anarcho-capitalists, whatever you want to call them, uh, zero government guys. There are a bunch of them who were career military <laughs> and and realize that this whole thing is just nuts right. and you know we want out and but you know who who would have guessed that you'd get career military guys you know who who have come this far um there's a lot of funny little things that go on uh, i wish i would have had the foresight to predict them all but i haven't <laughs> right one thing i really really enjoyed about the book was um reading about these intellectual communities that would, would spring up, um, you know, where people were working on these, mm -hmm. these projects together in this big space. And there was all this, I don't know, just this electric excitement about working on um, these projects together that would, you know, have these potentially really big impacts on the world and all that stuff. And I would be really curious to hear about your experience or your inspiration for, um, for, that, uh, for that idea. Okay. Great question. Um, I'm going to have to uh, be a little bit less than precise in my description <laughs> to, protect, to protect the innocent. Um, but I was involved at one point in something not precisely the same as the Free Soul House, but not too terribly different. And I want to tell you, it was a gas. It was a lot of fun. We had a, a big house in uh, Latin America where all sorts of people were living and working on very cool projects all at the same time. We had programmers. We had some kind of financial sorts of guys. We had people working on legal things. Um, there were actually two houses uh, that were going at all times full of people like this we had and there was a you know a, a very nice restaurant right down the street next to one of them and uh it was just it was a gas it wasn't quite the same as the free soul house but it was it was in in a lot of ways quite similar and it was a lot of fun i mean i i for all of the craziness that went on i really miss it so yeah it it, it really did exist that way And there were other points in my life where I was around other people earlier, let's call it uh, the 70s, uh, when I had friends that we were all living together and, um, you know, we had a, a big house and 
um, every so often people would just come, would just show up. Hey, every, everyone, come on over on Saturday night. And we'd get 20, 30 people, some, a lot of single people, some with families, bringing their kids, everyone bring a guitar. Uh, you know, the ladies would bring some food. Um, some of the older guys would kind of make sure the younger guys, you know, uh, stayed sane. And uh, people would just come and stay and hang out. And in one room, there would be people playing guitar and singing. In another room, there would be people sitting and talking. There would be children playing out somewhere else. It was, a, it was wonderful. You know, there's just there's certain moments in life when you get things like that. And gosh, they're great. And I wanted to try to capture some of that feeling in some of this because uh, it's too rare and a lot of people never really see it that way. And it's just a beautiful thing. It's the way people should live frequently. Yeah, it uh, kind of reminds me of different flavors of this sort of uh, Galt's Gulch um, idea. Yeah. Of these very mm-hmm. philosophically similarly minded people uh, kind of – uh, forming communities, co cohabitating, working on projects together, and uh, that's a really exciting idea. I was wondering, do you have any um, advice for people that are looking to get involved with those kind of communities or start their own or that kind of thing? Yeah, actually, actually, I do, um, and that is probably two things. Uh, first is uh, be very serious about. Uh, principles and quality. If you're going to be living with people, make sure that they're, you know, the basic things are there. They're they're decent, solid human beings. You don't have to agree with everything, but they have to be decent, reasonable human beings. And number two is just freaking do it. Uh, you're going to never get it perfect in advance. There's always going to be things that you didn't expect, mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. That's just the way it is. Accept that. Uh, and you, you know, you can sit and wait forever trying to get it just right and trying to, um, you know, get it perfect and figuring out what you're going to do and what your goals are and what your program to get those goals are, but you're never going to get that right. Um, so, you know, make, make a decent plan, uh, get as many good and decent people as you can be flexible and just do it because if you wait till it's perfect, nothing ever is going to happen. Um, you know, just so you guys know, I I I, I happen to write a uh, a newsletter, by the way, and I wrote an issue, gosh, three four months ago. Um, if any of you want a copy of it, just let me know, and I'll be glad to get it for you. It's called "The Lost Art of Living with Intent," and it is uh, basically a history of all of the um, communities that formed in North America in the 1800s. There were hundreds of communities like like we're discussing. Um, some of them were religious communities. Some of them were, uh, oh gosh, the early socialists before you know communism became uh, a death cult. Um, and there were there were literally I counted 118, and those were just the major ones. And I you know wasn't going to spend you know two weeks doing research to to, to find more. Uh, and I wrote, oh, you know, an issue on these people and how they lived and what they did. And if you if you want a copy of it, just let me know, and I'll be glad to send it to you. I was just going to say, Paul. I think it was also the the individualist anarchists in the nineteenth century. There were a few of them were involved in in um, community experiments as well. I, I think too. So there's uh, yeah, absolutely there's, they were. Yes. Yeah. Actually, some of the best communities were were some of them. Yeah. yeah. Jeffrey Tucker and his people. Mm. And I just wanted to say also that I, I agree with uh, what Christoph was saying. I thought that was a really uh, great, great aspect of the book. And it certainly gets you thinking, particularly for those of us who are interested in, um, uh, you know, in alternatives to the uh, compulsory education system for our kids in the future. Right. You know, um, if you want to unschool your kids then, or homeschool uh, or whatever, then... It's, uh, mm-hmm. it's really important to have a community of people around you that uh, that you feel you that you can you know trust um, with with uh, with your kids. So I think it's a really interesting idea. Good, good. Yeah, I th- I, th- I I am really a, a strong advocate of homeschooling. I, I think it's very important. Uh, I think it's better for children. I think it's better for families. Um, and you know, government schooling has just 
I mean, it, it was bad a hundred years ago, and it's worse now. So, absolutely. You know, I I think people should escape it every time they can. That's the end of part one of this interview, and the rest of the interview can be found in the next episode in part two. Thank you so much for listening.